Last time we talked was in April, and we made a little news. Um, <laughs> I was asking you to explain yield farming, and you did it in this way that sort of described a box that tokens came out of, and people put money into the box, and uh, there was a sort of self-sustaining flywheel where people put more money into the box, the tokens were worth more, and they went up. And I used the Ponzi word in reaction <laughs> to that, and you didn't exactly endorse that, but definitely the crypto market went down shortly after that <laughs> conversation. Um, and I just, I wanted to revisit that a little bit. Like, you know, at the time, I think we were abstracting away from the usefulness of crypto projects, yep. and just sort of talking about tokenomics. But given that the token market kind of collapsed, like, what lessons should we draw about the usefulness? Like, how much of crypto at that time was kind of people investing because line went up rather than because of like usefulness of projects? Yeah, and it's, that is certainly some. It's some of it for the whole space, and more strongly than that, it was some of it for many spaces, right? Like, I mean, Nasdaq's down what, like forty percent or something like that since since the peak, um, and and so some of this is is herd behavior. Some of it is herd behavior triggered by monetary policy, right? Like to the extent that you you know the world believed that there is going to be easy money forever and you know all numbers would keep going up except for the value of the dollar um you know people kept investing and then there's a strong you know signal change and all of a sudden people felt like numbers could go down because maybe money was going to flow out of this system um instead of into it and and sort of you know every, everything came down in price and, and so some of this is not a crypto specific phenomenon some of this is like what investing looked like at sort of peak mania um but you know i think putting that aside you know, I, I think that Bitcoin's price roughly reflects that dynamic of like inflows and outflows into the monetary ecosystem. Um, I think that like certainly the asset, you know, price decline was a, a strong sign that in crypto and frankly in a lot of fintech, like there, like things were way too light on use cases and that there was a lot of hand waving going on both on use cases and on sort of financial modeling that was uh, suspect, um, but I think beyond those two, you can look. You can look at things that didn't just fall 60% in this crash, but fell 99% in the fall, and that's when I start. Think you start to look at things that were sort of worse than just like, yeah, there is a change in monetary policy, a change in investor sentiment. Like those are the types of things where there was probably artificial mechanisms, sort of that were you know creating these flywheel wheels, driving it up with nothing fundamental backing it and then the flywheel starts to, to falter and the whole thing crashes back down. And obviously Luna is like, you know, the, the prototypical example of that, Celsius probably you'd put in, it in a similar bucket. And, um, and I, I think, you know, that, that sort of is a layer of, which I think is a lot of the long tail space of crypto and some selection of what were considered sort of, you know, more respected second tier um, places that, that were probably worse than, than just like, you know, monetary policy change. I think that people say a lot of, about bubbles is that there's a sort of misallocation of capital. And like, yeah. like, does that make sense in this space, like to talk about that? And like, yeah. is capital being like sort of better allocated now after the winter? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. And, and I think it does make sense to talk about that. And I think that like, you know, where have the sort of re-ratings been, so to speak, where is the, the, or the relative re-ratings been? I think one thing, when you look at the companies in crypto and frankly across the space, I think profitability was sort of a dirty word for a number of years and it is returned to investor parlance, right? Like last year, if you saw a typical funding round from VCs, like was that valuation related to the profit of the company? Probably not. Like revenue was sort of like, like there's sort of, without saying so explicitly, everyone just subtly slipped from like, you know, EBITDA or profit or something to, to just purely revenue as like the driver of value and like no thought towards like how profit would eventually catch up to that. And I think that there's been a substantial re-rating towards looking for at least likely or at least plausible pathways towards profitability being a core component of an investment thesis in a company, which feels a little strange to say, but, but I think was something that was kind of missing. Um, and then when you look at tokens, um, uh, I, I think that like there's this sort of question of like if it everyone woke up one day and this thing was missing was gone would anyone miss it right like like would anyone be like oh shit like someone has to go start the new this thing now that 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 old copy was gone 
And I think that that's been like a fairly strong predictor of which things have survived versus which things have not. And I think that like, um, you know, obviously, like stable coins have survived, exchanges have survived, um, I, blockchains that have some property that is sort of like plausibly superior to other blockchains have survived, um, including just being like a, a more consensus, um, you know, a, a mechanism with like more built-in consensus from lots of players. And things where like, if they went away, you would forget they ever existed, have generally sort of gone away and people have started to forget that, that they existed. Can I ask what your, what your sort of interest or knowledge of this is? Like, like in your day job, I think of you as like running an arbitrage fund and running an exchange that kind of like clips fees from people trading stuff. Like how important to you, to you in your job is it that things be robust or useful and how much of it is like, if the number is moving around, then I'm, I can make a profit on it? Locally speaking, it's mostly driven by the latter. Like, if, if you want to say, like, what's going to determine how much, you know, revenue we make next month? Like, realistically speaking, like, whatever, that's going to be a function of volatility and, 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 and volume and monetary flows and, and, and things like that. Um, and, and that's the same thing if you look at, you know, NASDAQ, right? Like, what, what what's going to determine NASDAQ's Q3 earnings this year? People aren't sort of looking at, like, fundamental, like, you know, long-term business models of things. People are saying, like, well, I don't know what's market fault going to be like. Um, I think when you look in a longer-term view, though, I think it is quite important. Um, I, when, when I say Jane Street trading, this is something that, like, some of the more senior people there would say sometimes, and kind of not long, but not really, not that I disagree, but it, it didn't really sink into me, which is, you know, they say, yeah, look, sometimes volatile days can be good for profit, but in the long-run view, like, we like it when markets are healthy and efficient and going up and stable because that is in the long run what just creates more activity, right? And, and like even if you ignore any altruistic things here, right? It's just like that that's what long run and, and, and I think there's a similar thing here where like how healthy the ecosystem is in the long run is gonna be a very strong predictor of you know how much we can grow. So on that note I wanna talk about, you know, one big symptom of the crypto winter is like there's been a blow up of a number of platforms that I would sort of loosely call crypto shadow banks, um, where they're sort yep. of taking in short-term demand money from customers and lending it in weird opaque ways. And you have touched in some form probably all of those. Uh, you've been a, a lender, a borrower, a rescuer. Um, <clears throat> so like the natural segue is like, uh, how much of the rescuing activity is about that very long run view of like it is healthier for the crypto ecosystem that you are levered to for depositors not to be constantly blown up. That's a real part of it. Like, and, and maybe to make this like more concrete, like the explicit sort of like working principle we had in a number of these was like, it's okay to do a deal that is moderately bad right. in, in bailing out a place. Like the bar was not, this is a good return on investment. The bar is like, this is not that bad of a return on investment or like we are incinerating a relatively small-ish amount of money in doing this. Um, and just to tease that out, you're incinerating a small amount of money because, like, in the long run, you get a large amount of money from the crypto ecosystem being healthy. I was going to say healthy, but I almost said popular. Like, <laughs> well, I think it's. I, I think if you want to look at it from just a strictly business case, right? And, and obviously, if you know, whatever fiscal duty to to you know shareholders to do things that make sense for FTX, you know, you could say, look, it's. It's it being healthy that would cause it to be popular, right? Like yeah. ultimately, it's the popularity that would matter, but like that there's a flow through from health there, which is sort of the operative thing. I think there's also just a thing of like, you know, we need to be a good constructive factor in this space. If we're not, it's just like bad on many levels, and and ways that we can be, um, uh, I I think we'll sort of like be a diffuse good that like whatever we don't need to know beforehand exactly how that pays off. So. When I look at the things that you did, some of them are you sort of like, I'm going to shorthand it, you bought BlockFi. Uh, <laughs> you did not buy, Vo buy Voyager, and you um, incinerated $75 million on Voyager and then said, that's enough, thank you. <laughs> um, and then you, I think loosely speaking, incinerated no dollars on Celsius because you were like, that's definitely enough, thank you. Um, <laughs> talk about like, Talk sort of generally about how you make those decisions and like what, like, yeah. like 
like when when someone's bad, like what's bad about them? When someone's like blown up but good enough to get an yep. investment, like what were they doing right? You know, like give me a sense of what's going on there. Totally. And taking a step back, like when we have to make the first decision, we don't yet know. Right. Sometimes which is like if you like called me up tomorrow night and you're like some very weird things happened and like I'm going to die if you don't wire me two thousand dollars, right? Like I'd be like, okay, fine, let's deal with that, making sure you don't die, and then we can talk about what exactly happened to get us there. Um, and like Except that. Except for Celsius. It, <laughs> uh, right. And, <laughs> and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll tell a little bit about like the first conversation at High Vault that I had with, um, sort of, I'll give a model conversation. This is how I would like the first conversation to right. go. And it reflected some, but not all of our first conversations, which is we get on the phone and the other party says, hey, thanks for taking the call. We, we are sort of in trouble. It's a little ambiguous. Here's exactly where we are. Here's where our balance sheet is today. Here's our assets. Here's our liabilities. Here's the uncertainty in it, roughly speaking, ballpark. Here's where it's coming from. Pause for a second. You know, and uh, I want you to continue, but yeah. I want a little bit more. Like, 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 when they say here are assets, here yep. are liabilities. Like, which number is bigger? Right. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, I hear you. <laughs> But an even Do they use numbers? <laughs> that's the first, right? The first test is not even which is bigger. The first test is do I walk away from that first call feeling moderately confident that I know what the numbers are? Whether or not they're good, do I even know them, right? right? And like that was like sort of like the, the test for us to like consider doing like just some emergency thing while we figure out other things. One of the criteria was that we know what the numbers are, whether or not they're good. Um, and some failed that test of like, not just the numbers were bad, but like we literally came away confused, and like we had a second and, call. And that's not like that's not like valuation. That's no, like, no, that's yeah. that's like we think either they're not being transparent with us, or they don't know their own business. Right. But one way or another, they like cannot tell us the number in this account. And like whatever you mark these into, but we don't even know how many shares of that illiquid thing they have, right? Like it's just like there's nothing there. And and of course, no one knew how to mark three hours capital debt. The day after this happened, right? Like that was one of the biggest. That's like a was, number you put on it. Exactly, right? We would have accepted and this amount of debt with three arrows as part of this, right? Um, so that's step one is like literally, do we know what is going on? Um, and then then step two is like, right? We, we do kind of the obvious thing if we compare the two sides of this ledger, right? And like, in the cases where it was most obvious to do something is when they are about equal, right? <laughs> when, when, when the assets and the liabilities are like roughly the same number and you can imagine someone saying look here's the outstanding uncertainties we have it is plus or minus 20 million depending on those uncertainties right that's the place where it's sort of like most obvious that we should act because if we don't they might be slightly underwater and there are serious questions about like do they have to take drastic corporate action but for like a relatively small um you know sort of like potential incineration of money, we can like resolve that problem and make them able to like continue operating and like carry on and not like cause contagion or customers losing assets or anything like that. So that sort of like is the best case. Well, okay, the best case is that I have tons of extra capital, but then why are they calling us? Um, so, okay, of the, of the calls we might get, the best case is when they have about zero left, right? And you know they're like, look, we need a buffer here so that we can like definitely pay salaries without dipping into customer funds, like you know. And we're like, that that makes sense, <laughs> right? And, and in those cases, like what we would tend to do is like, okay, because otherwise they would. But, well, <laughs> depending on the company, right? right? Otherwise they maybe they would declare bankruptcy or maybe they would dip into customer whatever. There's a lot of unpleasant choices there, right? Um, and so in that case, what we'd say is like, okay. First things first, let's just give you a line for something, I don't know, 50 million, whatever. Something that is like definitely bigger than the like plausible downside here. So you definitely have a surplus. And we'll make it junior to customer assets. And it's the amount of money where if we totally misunderstood this, like it's okay, it's a little sad, but like whatever, shit happens. And, and then we can talk about what's next. Junior to customer assets, is that purely being a good citizen for the ecosystem? Because it seems like people yeah. can not do that. <laughs> it seems like one option is to not do that. Yeah, so the way I see it is like, there are cases where it makes sense to do it, not junior to it, but it doesn't actually solve the, like, the fundamental problem here, right? Like, and, and so like, it's, I think basic the answer is like, yes, like, I, I don't know, I would feel kind of like, I don't know, we're giving you this senior line, maybe it's useful for you, but this isn't like, I don't feel like that solved their 
the problem that they, morally speaking it hasn't solved their problem, right? right? Like, I, it, I, I think basically, yeah, like that, that seems like a shitty way to, way to structure it. What can you tell me what the problem is? Because, like, I mean, I, like, yep. there are two sort of broad ways to carry yep. this problem, which is like run on a bank or yes. balance sheet and so Oh, I uh, totally agree. And, and that's a good point, which is that there's sort of liquidity versus net asset value at the or whatever, you know, however you want to think about it. And, and, and the junior versus senior thing is primarily a uh, net asset value type thing of like, at the end of the day, will customers get their money back eventually? Whereas a senior line can be useful and it can be, and so the senior line is something we'd absolutely consider if what was going on was say a mismatch in durations. So one hypothesis about Celsius, which did not turn out to be true, but which was speculated about was that they were completely, totally fine, except that they'd taken a lot of customer Ethereum and staked it on ETH2 and that it was going to be about a year before they could realize that ETH2 and the customers might try and withdraw before then, right? And in that world, then actually a senior line of Ethereum floated to them equal to that balance would be all they needed, right? And so if it's just a liquidity crunch, then absolutely like senior line is totally fine. If it's a net asset value crunch, then it's a lot less clear that a senior, you know, that senior debt is, is super helpful there. And by the way, like the different platforms took completely different approaches to how much they gave a shit about the net asset value version of this, right? Some of them gave many shit, some of them did not. And what, in what, what do you mean? Like, well, so like everyone had to care about liquidity, right? If customers try to withdraw and you can't fill the withdrawal, your business ends. So like, you know, that, that, was, that, that was clear to people. Um, I'm being a little bit like apocalyptic. So you're saying some people didn't, didn't seem worried that their equity was negative? Yeah, or whatever. There's definitional things going on here, right? You, you, you can mark things to whatever you can serve, but, but like there were a lot of cases where, where I think like we felt like they had been maybe less than, than maximally responsible in terms of their actual underlying financial health. Well, I mean, let me ask a general question. Like, yep. like one thing that I think is striking about these situations is that like their healthy situation was like 20 to one leverage. Right where like the liabilities are demand deposits from retail customers yep. and the assets are unsecured loans to yep. fly by night hedge funds and like you know yep. investments in volatile assets uh -huh. like what happened like how did how like can you like yeah like, how does that happen <laughs> right okay so let me describe two different things one could have done thing one lend a billion dollars to three hours capital and take 1.3 billion dollars of random crap as collateral right a second thing one could have done is the first half of that sentence, right? Right. Without the second half. Right. And I think that there's a very big difference between those two, right? Like fundamentally there's risk in both, but with the first one, optimistically, the risk that you're looking at is like maybe something illiquidity market move quick, something, something. And there's like a 10% haircut on that. If you get unlucky, it's sort of like, maybe, maybe they're so illiquid that's much more than that, but like, the second one is like something, something, 100% haircut. Like, and, and so I think that like, like unsecured was like a relevant piece of what you said. And, and I think an interesting thing is that like, like that was a very big determinant of whether a platform blew out is if they had debt with three arrows, was their collateral posted in return? Um, the interesting thing is that like, um, some platforms did, some platforms didn't, that completely changed the situation. But from an outside perspective, what was the incentive mechanism on them to bother asking for the collateral? Like, obviously, at, at this point, a lot of people wish they did, but like, so much is about the details. Details, I mean, sort of a big detail, but, but like, it, but, 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 Where did we put all our money? But, but it's not like you open up the app and this is obvious, right? It's not like, it's not like it, it's sort of like, an obvious functional part of the product. Some of these were coin flips about whether they bothered asking harder for collateral or not. And like, it's an incredibly important decision, um, but it's one which like there is no punishment for at all what you did until everything blew apart. And there was no, and like, if you're thinking about like what could regulation have done here, right? I think one thing that regulation would really want to do is like ask, is there collateral, right? Like that, that seems like a really important perspective that like there should have been some amount of oversight or transparency or like, you know, enforce good risk management on, but there just wasn't. And again, from an outward facing perspective, no one has any idea whether or not you actually got that collateral. Can, like why does three hours need so much unsecured lending? I mean, like broadly speaking, they're a hedge fund, right? They're financing positions. Why aren't they pledging the positions that they're financing? I, well, at the end of the day, they 
sort of ultimately did in that their positions are all gone now. Um, now, that's Why are they pledging to, them to Celsius? But okay. Right, right. Well, okay. Maybe they pledge them to Celsius and also to many other people at once. Sure. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that's but, what unsecured loan is. Right, right, right. Um, but maybe, maybe another way of saying this is like, how did they lose so much money? Is like, like, like fundamentally, it's, it's not that like Thurier's positions were illiquid. I think they were just like lost money. Like at the end of the day, their net asset value is very negative. And if you get into that position, like nothing, like people lost somehow, right? And, and I think basic answer is like, I don't know, they were like, not, probably, I, I don't know exactly what they're doing, but like that certainly hints as them not being like a sort of like low risk arbitrage firm and more of a like had giant positions on and sometimes they did well and other times they didn't type firm. And I think that their like debt was probably rated treating them as more of an arbitrage firm and their trading was probably much more punting than market making. So your hedge fund also borrows from these platforms, like, or borrowed, I guess. Um, can you talk about, like, sort of what's, like, is that sort of, like, ordinary course financing positions? Is that arbitrages? Are you secured? It, it's all, so, again, there's there's some variety here. Um, generally, they're uh, at least decently secured. Often they're over-secured. Um, and I think basically, like, par part of the underlying thing here is it's it's, hard to get capital into the crypto ecosystem. Like there's giant bottlenecks, regulatory among other things. And so the spigots that you do see are like people will de like develop some sort of spigot to connect non-crypto money with crypto money and then sort of like grow the hell out of it and like try and get as much as they can through that spigot because the other spigots aren't working. And this has been one of the ways that capital got into the crypto ecosystem in the first place. Obviously there's been a huge outflow of that capital, not surprisingly, over the last couple months. Um, when you say this, like 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 retail deposits on these on these shadow banks, which are which are like as an example, crypto money. yeah, yeah. Um, but there there's others. So there's institutional money in there as well. Yeah. Um, it's not all retail. Um, and uh, that institutional yep. money is functionally like we're going to give money to a platform which is going to lend it out as sort of senior claims on crypto yep. to crypto hedge funds. That's basically right. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so you're getting all these calls about rescuing. Why are they calling you? Like, 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 why aren't you making the calls? Like, what, what's the difference between like you run a sort of exchange, right. you, run, you know, like, you, like, yeah. like what? What's it, what right. are you doing right? <laughs> um, collateral. Um, so, well, but but seriously, like, that is sort of, and this actually interestingly ties into our CFTC application just to some extent. Yeah. Right. You know, when, when you look at what is FTX, um, let's ignore the spot trading for a second and just look at the derivatives piece of this, right? Where, um, although spot margin, whatever, looks a lot like derivatives in some, some lenses, um, the, the way that a risk engine works effectively is, you know, your cousin Jill wants to, I don't know if you, you probably don't have a cousin Jill, but pretend you did. Um, sure, I can do that. Yeah, cool. Um, you can substitute the name in your head for you, right? right. Um, uh, so, you know, <laughs> Jill has a family office that wants, whatever, to put on a $100,000 Bitcoin futures position, right? Step one, okay, step one is know your customer process, blah, blah, blah. They have an account now. Um, step one of the, like, trading piece of this is not them sending an order. Um, step one is them depositing collateral to the clearinghouse. Um, so, you know, they deposit $30,000 of collateral to the clearinghouse. Clearinghouse recognizes it says, great, you've got margin, puts on a $100,000 position. From the clearinghouse's perspective, there's no money outside of that $30,000. Like, it's not saying, if Jill loses a lot on this, that's fine, we'll call her up. It assumes she will not take that phone call. And that the risk engine has to manage this such that that's okay. It has to manage this such that, you know, Bitcoin starts going down, that amount of collateral remaining starts to decrease eventually issues a margin call, and has to do that before that number goes negative. Like, it has to do that while there's still positive amounts of remaining equity value in the account, with the goal of never having any account go negative, even given no recourse, given that, like, you can never call someone up. Um, a different model that you could have is, step one, Jill puts on a position. Step two, Bitcoin goes down. Step three, you call up Jill and you say, please deposit $15,000 because that's the amount that your position is underwater right now. Model two, the risk is that she doesn't pick up the phone, 
right? Maybe she doesn't have any money. Maybe she would prefer to have the money than to give it to you. Um, many people would prefer that. For one reason or another, right, if she doesn't pick up the phone, you've got a hole in the system. You've got a $15,000 hole in the system. And, I, uh, you know, that's got to be either you're paying out of pocket or it's socialized or something. The way that we try and structure it is that there's no, they don't pick up risk because we require collateral deposited b b you know, beforehand. And so what that means is, yeah, yeah, there's a big market move. And in fact, some of the names that you've heard about had accounts on FTX, um, but like they had collateral there. And like if they refused to answer a margin call, like eventually we deleveraged their position um, while they still had non-negative account equity value left. And so there's no overall contagion or hit to the system. Would you say that like there was stressing or testing of your kind of like liquidation models during the yeah. last like month or two? And like, what did you learn? Yeah, so I mean, Bitcoin fell from like 30K to 20K at around 11 p.m. on a Sunday, I think roughly, um, which is, it's not the most liquid time in the world. Um, and, uh, and, and so we got to see empirically like, okay, you know, we had whatever, how many billions of, of open interest, like some of that was levered long. Like what happens when there's a 30% market move, uh, you know, triggered over a two day period roughly. Um, and I, you know, we, uh, I will say that I had a business trip that week. I was flying out like Sunday or Monday. And, and like, when I sort of got to the place, I was like, this is dumb. I should fly back to the office. Like the market literally just dropped 30% since I like took off. Like I need to be at work, not like dicking around here, like trying to, you know, talk with outside parties. Um, and I, I sort of like called people and like, you know, looked at Slack, called people. And, and one of the most surprising things to me was that like, there actually like nothing was on fire in terms of like our systems. Like, like ultimately I did not fly back and, and it was fine. What would you have done? If... Like, would you have like hit the liquidate button faster? Well, that, that was the thing. The answer is there's nothing for me to do, <laughs> right? I, I sort of like, hey guys, can I help? And they're like, what would you do, right? And like, <laughs> Is there anything that needs help? So like, I don't know. Do you want to buy Bitcoin? Like, I, I mean, <laughs> did you? Um, I, that, that would have helped. It, it, it would have. Um, <laughs> well, we had we did have real conversations at some point about like at what point. So FTX keeps its treasury in dollars. Like, we did have conversations at some point about like at some point we just buy Bitcoins, right? Like, there there was a price. We did not hit that price, but we had a price in mind of like. At this price, we will start to buy Bitcoin. And that would have been out of FTX. Yeah, it would have been. And yeah, I, I don't like actually operate Alameda anymore day to day. Right. And so it's, you know, they were sort of doing a, a variety of trades, the details of which I, I don't know. But like at some point, FTX could could purchase crypto on its own, own balance sheet. It's like not exactly a hedge for a business, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> right, at some price, sure, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, I mean, and it's in the same vein as sort of everything else, which yeah. we've talked about, where, where it's like, you know, the, the, the nice way to put it would be being sort of pro-social to the to the crypto yep. ecosystem, where like you are bailing out yep. positive-facing platforms, right. you're buying Bitcoin. Yeah, um, and, and sort of some of this came to the question of like which needs a bailout more, Bitcoin or depositor-facing platforms? And I think our answer is depositor-facing platforms. But you could have imagined a slightly different world where the answer is Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Where like there's more sell pressure on the asset and fewer under-collateralized platforms, in which like that would have shifted that calculus uh, a little bit there. Um, but yeah, it's basically nothing was on fire. It sort of like worked somewhat smoothly. And under collateralized platforms uh, are in the long run sort of supportive of, of crypto generally, or if, if you're bailing them out, right? Like you're you're getting people back in. Yeah, getting people back in, making sure that there aren't customer losses, making sure there's some contagion that spreads through the ecosystem of like debt on debt on debt, sort of like you know collapsing. Um, and I mean separately. I think there are like hard risk management questions that a lot of these platforms would need to ask themselves, even in the case where they're fully made it through this event. Right. Um, but like that's sort of that's step two, and step one is like stabilize, and step two is like think about what the whether this business model and this implementation of it made sense in the first place. Yeah, I am curious, just like why people thought running twenty to one leverage with this model yeah. worked, and why people let them. Yeah, well, so on the let them, again, it's not even clear you could tell as a customer yeah. what the leverage was, right? Which is a problem like, enough itself, but... They're like, it seems to me that there are institutional players facing places like Celsius yep. and Voyager and, and yep. the fact that no one was like, 20 to 1, huh? Well, so the institutional players don't necessarily see their whole book, yeah. right? Like, 
like they don't necessarily know if most of their loans were over collateralized or not at all collateralized. Um, and the platforms themselves were the only ones who saw their whole books and actually knew what those, and, and, and like, you know, we sort of got to look at a lot of those books after the fact when we were sort of in, in bailout mode. But, um, but I did not know prior to that exactly what state each of these places books were actually in to begin with. And, and they'll all give you pitches, which are probably a little over optimistic on average about what their real risk looks like. So we only have like a minute left. Um, I want to just quickly ask about effective altruism. Um, like one model for your kind of like utilitarian calculus is that uh, you, that a lot of people want to gamble. Crypto is, a, is both a good sector for gambling and a very efficient way to extract fees from gamblers if you run a crypto exchange. Um, and you are sort of in the business of funneling money from people who are going to use it poorly on gambling to like animal charities and pandemic preparedness and Joe Biden. Um, is that too cynical of you or is that not cynical at all or what? I, I think it is too cynical. I, I think this is also something I've gotten more appreciation for over time. I, I, I think I sort of like had much more unformed thoughts of this uh, earlier in my life. But, you know, I think I've increasingly come of the view that like it is, uh, at the very least, I want to be doing something net positive, like with the, the making money part, like, like I, I want to be a good actor there. And, and, and I think that like part of it is just like it is unsustainable if you're not and has a huge number of bad flow through effects and um, and, and it's destabilizing for society to, to some extent. And so I think like, um, you know, I, I like am to some extent in the business of like, you know, making money and then giving it away like that. That is absolutely what I'm in the business of. But I do want to try and make sure that like that first that even if I think a lot of the value is created in the second step, that that first step is not destructive.